Okay, uh, welcome uh, to another episode of Crying Page of Botany Does it. And why don't you say hi to everybody over there? Hey. So we're in Rotorua, New Zealand. We're uh, examining a species of fungus that exhibits a very peculiar trait. That is, it is a sacodioid fungus that's got a cap that doesn't open. And this specific species of sacodioid fungus is Psilocybe wararoa. Sacodioid fungi, uh, well, being sacodioid is a trait that many fungi in New Zealand uh, exhibit and uh, unrelated fungi as well. So there's obviously something in the environment that is selecting for this very bizarre trait among fungi. And uh, we're going to examine it and check out what it is. But first, look at that golf ball coming off of, uh, we can't tell what the substrate is. Normally when you see this species, and we saw plenty yesterday, they were growing on Cyathea tree fern stems that were decaying. But here, this is does not appear to be a Cyathea tree fern stem. But it's either way, I mean, it's you can see there's the blue color. There's there's the obvious uh, psilocin polymerization, which uh, indicates this is a very psychoactive species, uh, which indeed it is. And uh, Luke, would you like to, to include any testament to that here as we uh, as we get into the, to the weeds with it? Uh, yep, they are probably on par strength-wise for psychoactive compounds to the average cyanocins. So they're, which is quite strong. Which so is these quite are strong, yeah. Much stronger than Psilocybe cubensis, which, you yeah, know... Is yeah, far the, stronger than cubensis. And so this is... Uh, but this patch specifically uh, is not only very psycho... I mean, how many would you need to get to, to feel anything off this? Um, depends on the size and the person taking them. Let's say that one over there. So that big one, if it was fresh and edible, that would be more than enough to get you where you wanted to go. Okay, and so that's... That's a good dose. So these are very, very potent. But uh, another curious trait, especially with this patch, uh, with this patch notably, is that uh, you get something called wood lover's paralysis, right? Yeah, so specifically the wooded oa on this mountain, they seem to give a very high percentage of people that take them wood lover's paralysis. We're not 100% sure what it is. We think it's something that they're growing on here. It seems to be patch uh, specific. Because it's not, it doesn't, you don't always get it with the species. No, no, you, you can take these perfectly safely and not get it. Um, but on this particular mountain, yeah, there's something here that seems to make <laughs> you get wood lovers. And, and would you describe what it feels like? Because I've seen it happen to people with cyanescence before. It's, it's, I mean, it sounds terrifying, but it, and it, maybe it is for a little while, but it's certainly temporary, correct? Yeah, I've only experienced it once, and it was from the wooded oa from this mountain. Um, for me, it started with from my head. I couldn't swallow, chew, speak properly. It slowly worked its way down. I couldn't hold my head up. And was it total paralysis, or was it, was um, it mild? Or? It wasn't total paralysis. I have heard of people getting total paralysis. For me, I could drag myself around a little bit it took me about an hour before i had the feeling in my fingers enough to use my phone to so you were you were anybody. basically completely you were inoperable for like an hour or two yeah there was about two hours where i just had to sit down on the sofa and wait for <laughs> it to pass <laughs> it sounds like something that would be fun to dose someone with you know maybe if you're teasing them or even someone you don't like you know sounds mildly terrifying but regardless motor skills do come back uh, but uh, regardless, it's it's a very and no one's identified what the secondary metabolite is that this fungus is producing, and quite a few of the other wood loving species of psilocybe that cause wood lovers paralysis. So uh, once it can be identified, it can then potentially be tested for and avoided uh, if anywhere were to cultivate these in a spot where they're legal. But the the whole trait of being sacodioid, having a cap that doesn't open, is extremely bizarre, and uh, a couple of different. Uh, Hypotheses are out there, one of which is dispersal by snails, possibly, because we see a lot of these that are eaten by snails. Another one, which I tend to, I'm tending to lean more towards, is uh, they've, they've adapted to dispersal by birds. And of course, in a place where the only native mammals are bats, and uh, you get a wide diversity of uh, avian life here, many of which are already on the ground looking for uh, any of the numerous plant species fruits, the you know plants that produce fruits that they eat anyway, they'd uh, it'd be really easy for one of them to mistake, you know, a conspicuous little pearl, and that is very conspicuous in a dark and damp forest as we saw yesterday, for a fruit, fly off with it, eat it, and then mid-flight decide they don't really like it, spit it out somewhere, and uh, boom, you just got spore dispersal. So.
So again, we normally see these on Cyathea. They seem to love Cyathea medullaris, which is a tree fern, and this does not seem to be Cyathea. Uh, so maybe it is a substrate thing. So what we're going to do now is, uh, see there's a little, just looking like a little egg, not even a stalk on this one. We're going to go ahead and slice this one open. Uh, Alan's going to dissect it and we're going to see what the gills are doing inside because it's still got gills, though they're not uh, openly exposed to air currents. Get it like through butter, with that perfect razor blade. So look at that cross section right there. Ah, oh, yeah, you can still see the stipe. In there. Yeah, that's really cool looking. The gills are just all twisted up in there. And you could see, I mean, they're they're obviously producing spores. Look how dark they are. That is such a bizarre trait. And there's quite a few other species, uh, you know, non-psychoactive species that have this same trait of being psychoidal. Correct, Alan? Yeah, yeah. There's quite a few, especially in New Zealand, and then in the United States, many of them are out in the deserts. So the psychoidal habit may help with uh, dry habitats, but clearly that's not the reason uh, there's so many out here. Right, so like in the deserts, you know, a species like Podaxis pistillaris, it dries out, all those spores are still good, gets cracked open or just the wind blows it over, whatever, and you get those spores everywhere, but obviously this is not a dry habitat. So something else is selecting for it, and uh, many of them never, many of the ones here never seem to open. They just, but they are all seemingly very conspicuous, huh? Yeah. Almost every genus that's common has a Sicodioid uh, version of it. You got Conosibi, Agrosibi, Descolia, Lexinum, Boletus, Chlorophyllum. There's, there's a lot. A lot of those are in the United States, but we got some in New Zealand too. So a, a mushroom with a cap that doesn't open is a very peculiar trait, and apparently there's something selecting for it in the environment here. Probably birds. Yeah, and all of the other species of Psilocybe start out with brown caps. And these start out nearly white, and that's really unusual, so it probably is to attract the attention of birds. Another fascinating reason to study evolution and just life on Earth in general. It's crazy what pops up. So the same way a, a human who's breeding plants will select for certain phenotypic traits among plants, the environment will inadvertently select for phenotypic traits. Oh, that's a beautiful one. Yeah, this one's really Move cool. Fungi. Is that Cyanthia? I can't tell. Shall I open darker. this one too? Yeah, let's cut it open. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, look at that. That one, we were finding a few with stipes yesterday. That's That's got a stipe, but it's a very small one. Yeah, it's like a rudimentary stem. You can still see a blue color there. And so this initially wasn't even placed in the genus Psilocybe. No one knew that it was a Psilocybe. It was in its own genus Wararoa, and there were two other unrelated species of fungi in that genus as well. And they were placed in that genus by early mycologists simply on the fact that they had Sicodioid basidiocarps. So they had mushrooms that didn't open. Look at this guy, look at it. I didn't even see that. Oh yeah, there's two, Jesus Christ. And the little pin right there. Oh, Piper excelsum. Look at that. There's the inflorescences of it. In the same family as Kava. It produces saffron in those leaves, too. Something's really going to town on those leaves, huh? Common component of the understories here, Piper excelsum. So here's, here's a properly munted one. You can see it's been a... It's a pretty old in the stages of decomposition you can see those gills just basically decay and uh, notably it doesn't really smell that bad normally you expect rotting mushrooms to stink this actually smells kind of kind of pleasant very bizarre but we're going to go disperse this somewhere else in the forest hopefully on a suitable substrate so we can get more of these going we're going to help the fungus out look at that. i was even stepping on one tell me that doesn't that wouldn't be conspicuous in the dark and shady forest and now that you're going for a bushwalk you can spread all its spores around That lovely rhizomorphs too right there. Look at that little pin. Oh, look, it's so cute. Look at that. Almost looks like that damn Super Mario character. Huh? Speaking to a generation now, a specific generation. Look at that. It really, look, it's, oh, God, that's crazy. Look at how tight that is. Tightly oppressed to that stipe. It doesn't open. And you got two, three little guys forming right there. 
What a cool speed. This, this, this trait among fungi should be in evolution textbooks. Bird selecting for fungal morphology. Look at that, nice little coagulinopsis, an undescribed one growing at the base of the Cyathea. Club fungi. Cyathea medullaris, the tree fern, which is so, uh, so dominant, one of seven species native to New Zealand. Nice metrosideros, nice vining metrosideros climbing up this tree right there. You can see all the astelias up there. Everything is green, everything's covered in bryophytes, mosses, epiphytic ferns, astelia. Look at this guy. The fern diversity here is insane. Cyathea everywhere. You got podocarps, you got angiosperms, lots of broadleaf trees. Look, it's a Nidia excelsius seedling. Proteaceae. A bird pollinated proteaceae. Nice little hygrosabe. Little orange flame. Look at how the, the, more towards the base of that stipe, it's red. Very unusual texture on that cap, too. Little seedling of a common tree here called uh, Laurelia nova zealandiae, which is an atherospermatacea, which is a family I became familiar with in Tasmania, which uh, is also home to the genus Atherosperma. So Laurales is the order, the order of avocados, bay trees, etc., which uh, tend to produce a lot of weird volatile oils and uh, alkaloids. And certainly there's uh, reportedly alkaloids in the bark of this that was used uh, medicinally by the Maori. This is a little seedling. You see opposite leaved, uh, toothed margins, and a glabrous, uh, kind of like reddish brown mahogany stem. So, but that opposite leaf trait is uh, definitely the first thing I'd be looking for, opposite as opposed to alternate. And this is a seedling that can, of course, grow rather large. Common, uh, common component of the forest here. Look at that. So this species right here, this species of tree, this massive bastard we're looking at, is the same species as the vine I just showed you earlier, Metrosideros robusta. So they've got wind-blown seeds that end up uh, growing as epiphytes, that is, on other plants, you know, sometimes rimu growing up in a canopy, and then uh, they slowly send roots down. Uh, as you can see, the root seems to still be attached. I can't, yeah, it still is attached. You can see right clearly right there, it's the same. That, that vine is part of that tree. At least it looks like it. And then uh, they end up growing into strangling their, their host plant. It's not really a host because they're not a parasite, and then forming this large bastard. They can live upwards of a thousand years. You can see they got a possum guard up there because introduced brush tail possums from Australia are wreaking havoc on these. So I mean, it's mainly because these trees evolved without marsupials. Remember, the only native mammals here are bats. So little bastards, man, they got no, no predators here either. So they just end up wreaking havoc. It's not their fault. It's all just about ecology. How species spend millions of years evolving together as a network, isolated from other things. And then when you bring in those other things that didn't evolve with them, they can potentially cause havoc. So either way, pretty pretty remarkable. So this thing started out as a vine then turned into a large tree. Fucking wild. You can see all those all those epiphytes up there. It looks like it's a stelia. Probably a stelia hostata. Asparagales order a steliaceae to family. Yeah you can see there you go. There's a better there's a better view of that that what looks like a vine is actually part of the tree. You can see it just goes right into the trunk right there. We got a nice fluted buttressed base as well. You know, for added structural support. That's fucking wild, man. All right, and beneath this young Rimu, those pendant leaves of that podocarp, they, they can also get massive. You got this wonderful species of Blechnum. Blechnum Nova Zelandii. You can see right here, you got, you got the vegetative fronds collecting light, creating carbs producing carbs, and then right here you got a sporophyll. What's known as a sporophyll, it's just a sexy leaf. It's, it's only purpose is to produce spores, which you see it's doing very well right there. There's all this the saurian sporangia. Saurian just clusters of sporangia, but interesting, look at these little photosynthetic leaves it's got, or purely photosynthetic leaves it's got along that, uh, that rachis. Beautiful species too. But why the black? Just because they don't need to produce chlorophyll, or is there chlorophyll in there just covered up by another a, a red pigment or what? What a curious, <laughs> what a curious and cool fern, huh? 
Okay, we we had to take this little uh, this one of these uh, leaflets that has sporophyll out into the light because it's so juicy. See, so you got that revolute margin opening up, and then there's all those black soria under there. So is that an enthusium or is the uh, revolute margin acting like an enthusium? Revolute margin is just acting like an enthusium. So right here we got Favolacia pustulosa with the underside just looking like sourdough bread. See all those pores. It's the native member of a genus that's got a really, I won't want to say nasty invasive, but ubiquitous invasive, which seems to be out-competing the native one. There's the uh, invasive Favolacea. Mycenaceae, the Mycena family. These are kind of old. Let's see if we can get a better one. Let's take a nice look at that invasive Favolacea. Hard to believe this related to Mycena. But again, you got that sourdough texture on the underside. And you see this one everywhere, but you rarely see that one. Well, that's kind of an old one. This is a better, this is a much better, it's in better shape. I think the native one's slightly more beautiful. Alan, who's this little bastard? That guy right there. That's a Pluteus from section Cellulidurma. And it's going to have pink spores, you said? Yeah, the gills are white now, but if you look, see how closely spaced those gills are? And if you were to cut it in half, you'd see it had free gill attachment. And some of them stain blue, you said, huh? Yeah, uh, not this one, but other species of Plutea stain blue uh, due to the psilocin polymerization. So they got psilocybin in them, some of them. Yep, some of them. This is hilarious and cool at the same time. This, these things looking like young pine seedlings, this is a moss, Dawsonia superba. The, the moss family polytrichaceae it's a stalked moss it's a coalescent moss and get upwards of 60 centimeters tall incredibly weird you don't think of moss you don't think of, of bryophytes you know having uh having no vasculature as uh being uh coalescent nonetheless you know getting taller than uh, i don't know half an inch if that but there you go <laughs> it's so funny man god that's so wild let's take a close look at the at these stems too you can really see it when you zoom in Looks, looks like a like a moss that just uh, got put on steroids or something. See that? It's swolled up. I want to see the sporophyte. So remember, of course, in uh, in mosses and ferns, well, in all plants, you get alternation of generations. It's just in flowering plants, you don't really see it. The pollen is the gametophyte. You got gametophytes and sporophytes. In this moss, this is the gametophyte. All right? So this is akin to pollen of uh, of a flowering plant. That is so incredibly bizarre and cool. I saw another stalked moss yesterday. Real weird looking bastard from, a, from an entirely different family. Thought it was a Selaginella at first. He's growing beneath this uh, Cyathea delbata. Oh, look at that bright white underside, you schmuck. You like that, huh? Who's this guy then? So this looks is a very similar, but see, see the underside is very oh, white. It looks and like an actual Ganoderma. It, that's yeah. a Ganoderma over there. Yeah, we touch it, we get a brown stain. So that's what's called an artist conch. Um, Organoderma subgenus Elfvingia because uh, of the dull top. And so this has this dark mark here. And if we just leave this here in a few weeks, this uh, pore surface will regrow and the dark mark will disappear. So it's like an etch a sketch. What's this up here? What's this stuff? This is pretty cool. This is probably in the Polyperaceae. I put it on iNaturalist a couple minutes ago. So Petra will probably tell us what it is. She likes to go through those. Okay, what's this guy? This is cool too, this is a crust. A bright orange crust. I don't know which one. Oh, you know what? It's not a crust at all. It's uh, probably Hypomyces. So this is a Hypomyces that grows on polypores. Probably the same thing here. And it's uh, parasitizing this here. So what is Hypo, tell me what Hypomyces is. Hypomyces is an Ascomycete, and a lot of times it has these bright orange spores. So it's a parasite of uh, other, other fungi. Yeah. Okay, now what's, what's this little rods poking up from? What's this stuff? What's it doing? Here we got a whole bunch of black earth tongues. And there's a lot of different genera for earth tongues. So to figure out what genus it belongs in, you have to look with a hand lens. And if I look really close here, I can see that these are completely smooth. So this is geoglossum, and with this large size, it's probably geoglossum australe. 
So where, where are the spores being produced then? The where? hymenophore is the top part. So anything above the stem there is fertile and they have, uh, they're ascomycetes, so they have really cool ASCII. They have awesome spores. They can be really long, up to 100 micrometers long in some species. And they're septate, so they have a whole bunch of different segments. So we should remind everybody, to, you know, ascomycetes, of course, like morels, their spores are produced in ASCII. So these are microscopic features. Produced in ASCII as, op as opposed to basidia. And so what's the spore count on it? You got eight spores generally being produced in most ASCII uh, per, per ascus, a little sac, versus in uh, basidiomycetes, you got four spores produced in each uh, basidium. So let's see if we could just, so we just see if we could just zoom in a little bit. Oh, the light's kind of shit, can't see. Need, need more lighting. I would need more than just this camera can provide to look at the texture. I mean, they're microscopic anyway, but should also mention that these are uh, ectomycorrhizal. Look at that little rad, little flappy rad. These are ectomycorrhizal, so they're associating with uh, the roots of uh, nearby trees. Which I can't really tell what any of them are because they're too high. So, Alan, you got this nice, of course, you got it all fluffed up and ready to get photographed, but uh, this is a different species than what we were just looking at, huh? Yeah, this is trichoglossum because both the hymenophore and the stem have lots of tiny hairs. He, oh, yeah, you could see them. So, this, this, of course, is where a jeweler's loop or a hand lens uh, plays a crucial role. Yeah, if you just look, trying to identify these from cell phone photos, you often can't tell them apart unless it's a really good cell phone photo. And most cell phone photos are shit for uh, taxonomic purposes, at least. Yeah, look at they them. They can up be. There. Oh, that's nice. Like little little black spoons coming out of the the, uh, the forest floor. Are these ectomycorrhizal or saprotrophic? These are ectomycorrhizal. Look, you got filmy ferns all over the forest floor. Right. Very thin tissue here. That's why. Uh, that's why they need. To, they need especially, especially moist environments. You get sporangia on there. Oh yeah, look at that. And then right here we got a lovely asplenium, almost looking a uh, coniferous, almost looking like a thuya or something with that foliage. What do the uh, What do the sori look like there? God, there's so many cool members of this genus in New Zealand. It's wild. Ferns like it moist and shady. Okay, so right here in the dark understory, another great example of secodioid fungi. That is uh, fungi with caps that don't open. This is Clavogaster varescens from the family Strophariaceae. Zooming in, look at that. It just it looks like a little fruit. Ooh, just fell like that. Look at it. You're definitely, definitely trying to get noticed. Very conspicuous on this forest floor. Look at that beautiful blue color. Just saprotrophic, just just eating what's ever around for a nice little clump. It almost looks somewhat disturbing, like a wad of gum that someone spit out. But uh, is it, I can't tell that slime or spores down there. It is so bizarre. It's so cool to see, I mean, what's going on here. Presumably, of course, you can't prove it. You can't go back in time. You can't see how this happened, but you could certainly test for it. And there's actually a paper written about this trait in fungi. So... Coevolution with birds, with birds that are already on the ground looking for fruit. They're going to pick this up, either ingest it, maybe spit it out, who knows. Either way, those spores are getting carried off somehow. God, that's so cool. Okay, so yeah, I want you to go ahead and shine that UV light on there. Yeah, look at how they fluoresce. Yeah, these things are extremely fluorescent. The war, um, the Celestibi warora was not very fluorescent. It glow, glowed purple just a little bit, but these really light up a bright blue with an aqua color in the stem. So there's a secondary metabolite in there that's uh, that's doing that. Yeah. Okay, so also notable about the UV is uh, you got a liverwort there, which would almost be indistinguishable amongst the surrounding moss were it not for the UV light. So why don't you give it a go at that UV light? And again, whatever's in there is not reflecting the UV light, right? It's actually transforming it into visible light. Right. But obviously some sort of bizarre secondary metabolite is causing that, huh? Yeah. Let's do it again on the uh, clavogaster. Oh yeah, look at that. Vivid blue. Okay, so Luke, Clavogaster varescens, it's obviously much more blue than that psilocybe, but it does look similar in form. What are some other good distinguishing characteristics that separate this from uh, psilocybe that make it easy to not mistake for psilocybe where it wrote? So generally, Clavogaster are a lot more angular and elongated, 
whereas the Wiradoa are much rounder. The stipes on the Clavagaster is also yellow and it goes all the way to the top of the mushroom cap, as you can see when it's cross-sectioned. And also the gills are much more of a sponge than proper gills. It's a very easy way to tell the two apart. And that layer of purple up there towards the top of the cap. Too. Yeah, so that's the part where the stipe doesn't quite meet the, uh, meet the cap, but on the Wiradoa, as you would have seen previously, it, it goes There's right no secondary to the top. layer like that. Yeah, because yeah, look no, at how slimy that is, too. Very viscid. Yeah, they're very, very slimy compared to the, the Wiradoa as well. So also worth mentioning too is that the uh, Clavogaster is blue whereas the Psilocybe just stains blue. And that again is because of the uh, polymerization of uh, psilocin. This liverwort is really bizarre. The only way you can really see it, I mean there's other species of liverworts growing on this wall but that one really is, it's producing something that's turning that UV light into visible light. So it's got some sort of weird secondary chemistry. Very, very noticeable. <laughs> it's wild. Go on here, Shannon and this guy. Oh, yeah, Christ. God, that little, look at that, that little thing. What a weirdo. Only way we would have seen it was with the UV light. Otherwise, you just wouldn't even notice it. Wouldn't even pop up. Well, you're not going to be able to get much out of this because it's not flowering, but I just want you to know it exists because it's a member of the sunflower family order, Asterales, and it's a family I've never seen before. This is Alsuosmia macrophylla, and it's got uh, really beautiful red tubular flowers when it's going off in the summertime, as well as a uh, very sweet edible fruit. It forms a little vine. Look how glabrous everything is. I can't get over how glabrous everything is, though. So alternate leaves, <clears throat> not opposite. Little five five uh, petaled flowers, five fused petals on the flowers when it's going off. Get a margin too. Not quite dentate. Maybe it's a little dentate. Maybe like some dentures, like like granny dentures of a margin. Has anyone ever said that before? Probably not. Now here's a real nice one we've been seeing. It's kind of in rotten shape, but it's got nice sori on it, so it's got the reproductive structures. Perosia eleagnifolia. Because the uh, leaves, well, at least not here, but when they're covered in those nice uh, silvery hairs, look like uh, Eleagnus. And those hairs, you can see some of them right there. See that silvery, see that silvery uh, velvet? That ah, light sucks. It, uh, those hairs make it somewhat drought tolerant, so it uh, can it can dry out a little bit more so than some of the other ferns. But look, look at those story. They're all juicy, starting to rot because it's been on the ground that fell out of a tree. But a notable fern here in polypodiaceae and we've been seeing a lot of it so real stunner especially when they're fresh look it's a species of mesipterus to mesipterus with a teeth that makes any sense Silotaceae is the family here whisk fern family got those aristate appendages and those plasticky leaves this one growing terrestrially i've only seen them growing epiphytically before where's your two lobes synangia should be in axles of the leaves over there what's this bulbous thing up there that's that don't look like a synangia it's not it's not putting those spores out there Really weird, really weird uh, plant to see growing terrestrially. Probably a rich mycorrhizae in that duff that it's uh, no doubt benefiting from. A quote-unquote primitive lineage of ferns, although the taxonomists don't like it when you say that. I think it's fine. It's a good way to think of it. You know, gets you, gets you, in, gets you into thinking about things along uh, the lifespan of an evolutionary lineage. Another tree fern species in a different genus and also in a different family, Dixonia squarosa. It's got a much more stiff and scabbard uh, leaf than uh, the Cyathea, but I, can, I wish I could find a sporophyll. See how, see how it compares to Cyathea sporophylls. Look at the sori. Tree ferns can be real tricky, man. You can see you got these these uh, persistent uh, leaf shoots too. The the petioles, or I guess it'd be more of a rachis. Harryrachis.com. God, that is a massive remu. It's the biggest one I've seen. The closest leaves are like 80 feet above the ground. The Critium Cupressinum. You can see the, those pendant leaves up there. An ancient lineage of conifer. Going back to the Jurassic or the Triassic. And restricted to the Southern Hemisphere these days. I believe there's fossils from the Northern Hemisphere. Who knows when? Probably, uh, they're probably growing there in the Cretaceous. Bird dispersed naked seeds. It's a gymnosperm, so they're technically cones. But they just look like a little berry with a bait arrow attached to it. They get the birds to go eat them. Look at how massive that beast is. Christ. 
You know, it's always so pleasant to look up in these forests. The sky's been overcast every day we've been here, but such a lovely color of green. Such magnificent forests and isolated for so long. Well, that's all I got for you today. Hopefully you got some out of that. Have a great evening. Go fuck yourself. Bye. Look at that. Are you a wood pigeon? You're kind of large. Got a nice head. What are you doing up there? Beautiful coloration on that head. A little bit bigger than a football. Actually, probably the size of a basketball. Gorgeous little tubby. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. No shame in it. That's a beautiful bird. So robust. God damn, these things must have been hunted like hell. Come on, step. Don't be shy. Where are you going?